Hi everyone, welcome to Off the Podium. I have a very special guest today, pianist Craig Shepard. Welcome to Off the Podium. Thank you. When I was reading about you, one thing I realized were all the competitions that you've done and been successful at the competitions. When I was a kid, yeah, that's 50 were, years ago. Yeah, that's a long time ago, but but I still want to hear about it, the process of competing, because you know there's a lot of people out there, young people, people who compete uh, in music competitions, they have mixed feelings about it. The reason they have mixed feelings is because there's so many competitions today. Yeah. Um, in my day, uh, boy, do I sound old now, but in my day, um, there were just fewer competitions, yeah. and you had a better chance if you won a competition or even won one of the top prizes, you certainly had a better chance of having that help your career in one way or another. Uh -huh. Yeah. One thing that I realized, and we spoke briefly about this, but uh, it's all the recordings that you've done, all the performances, all the concerts that you've done throughout your career. One thing that I noticed was that you like performing things that are similar, for example, the Shostakovich. Mm -hmm. You have a concert that's just dedicated to Shostakovich. I've done that recently because I, I was just tired of the old style uh, competition. Uh, so we're talking about competitions. I was, I was tired of the old style uh, recital programs, you know, um, where you start with Bach and finish with, um, with uh, Messiaen or Zanakis or something like that. I felt that it was better to concentrate on a repertoire and really try to understand it. Yeah. And I think what started that off was when I did the Beethoven cycle here yeah. in 2003, 2004. Because you really are seeing the thought processes and the feeling processes of a great man starting at a young age and finishing right before he dies. Yes. And it, it, that is a, a, it's a responsibility, it's a privilege, it's, um, it's everything. Yeah. And um, you, I, I, I Titled it at the time, a Beethoven: A Journey. This, this yeah. was my, this was my, um, the, the title of the CDs, which a couple of people, particularly in the UK, found corny. But you know something, it is a journey, and I noticed after that that everybody started calling things journeys. Yeah, yeah. So I don't know whether I was the first, but maybe you know when when, when a word is out there in the spheres, you sort of, uh, you know, you you pick it up yourself. So it was one of the catchwords of the early two thousands, and people are still calling almost everything today a journey of one sort or another. Yeah. But that was the beginning, it was the Beethoven. Then I I wanted to do the uh, Bach Preludes and Fuse, which I had done a, a great number of anyway. But I said to myself, you know, you can't get on stage and do the Preludes and Fugues unless you've done all the two and three part inventions, yeah. the inventions of symphonies. And the truth is that when I was a kid, I did a bunch of inventions, and then I did a few symphonias, and I got stuck on the C, C major for some reason, which is actually one of the more difficult three-part inventions. And my teacher had to think quickly. Now, I was about 12, and she said, she said to me, why don't you do a prelude and fugue? And she gave me one of the preludes and fugues from book one. And I never looked back. And you see, the reason I took to the preludes and fugues was because that was adult material. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I was being treated as an adult. So at the age of 12, I thought, I don't need these two and three part inventions, yeah. you know what I mean? I had no idea how great they were yeah. until at the age of 55, 56, whatever, I, I took them up again in order to prepare myself for the well-tempered clavier. Yeah. And I, I, I realized it's a treasure trove of, of material, and particularly the three part inventions, which I think there's just not one, but they're all wonderful. And they, they all, they last all together a total of about 55 minutes, so it's a very short program. I did that in 2006. I did the first book of the Well Timber Club year 2007, the second book 2008. I was able to play it in different parts of the world. And that's sort of where these cycles started from. And I thought, this is, it's a good feeling, you know, like when you, when you want to do, I did the last three Schubert sonatas, which I had always wanted to, 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 to learn and perform. And then a lot of the, uh, the list year came along, 2011, so I did two of the three books of, of the uh, years of pilgrimage, the Année Pellerinage. I, I was chastised by a well-known colleague for not including book three, but he doesn't realize or didn't realize how difficult it is to get Nini just for the two of them. Yeah. You know? So uh, then after that, uh, was I, I did um, the Debussy Preludes. Mm -hmm. And then the WC Etudes, which I had done before anyway, uh, along with, um, because the Etudes only take 42, 43 minutes, so that's a half a program. So I did the two books of Image with um, Estomp, and that was that program. 
um, combining my three favorite uh, cycles of Debussy's piano music. And then after that, I guess, was the Shostakovich. And uh, now I'm doing the Art of the Fugue, uh -huh. uh, which I should have done many years ago as well. You know, <laughs> you think back to your earlier years and what you could have done, but I was learning other things and playing them. I was, you know, it's just... Uh, so there's your long answer for that about cycles. I read one of the interviews and you talked about how Bach is so important for you. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. Um, I, I hope it's not the interview where I talked about um, Bach not being as religious as... Uh, I, 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 had a, I had views at that particular point. I mean, he was a profoundly religious man, but I had views about religion in general at the time, which I've sort of since rethought, so I would not make that comment, whatever it was, it was in a written interview. But um, I, I think Bach is the beginning and end of everything, and, and people, many of my colleagues, many of our colleagues come to that realization ultimately. You know, when you're a kid, it's a funny thing with Bach, when I was a kid and I went to the Curtis Institute, I'll never forget this, my teacher, Eleanor Sokoloff, who's now 103 years old, yeah. bless her heart, she's, yeah. a, she's, she's, a, she's a, you know, a legend today, but you know, I went to Curtis, of course, I had all my eyes, young 17-year-olds do, on playing Rachmaninoff and Tchaikovsky and all the big stuff like this, and I would say to her, okay, Mrs. Sokoloff, what about Tchaikovsky, and I would get, not even through the name of the pr professor, she would say, Bach, <laughs> and I'd say, well, now, what about the rock, Bach, <laughs> and, you know, so I had to bring, for the three years I was at Curtis, I had to bring Bach every single week. Yeah. We didn't always get to it because I was doing other things, admittedly, but you know, I was doing, um, I did the, uh, several of the French suites, English suites, a lot of the well-tempered club beer. And um, as much as I probably fought it, you know, 17, 18 year olds have a lot of testosterone and yeah. they want to do, they want to do the big stuff. Yeah. I had already done the Rock Three um, in, in with with a local orchestra when I was seventeen, and had like everybody does with Rock Three, I had a fair, fairly fairly good success with it. So uh, you know, I, I wanted to continue on that traje trajectory because young people like success and they like you know whatever. Yeah. But she was determined that I was going to get a good background, yeah. and I can only thank her today for that. Um, and I think then when I was in my late twenties and I was living in London. I decided that I wanted to do the Clavier Ubunk. In fact, I think it was maybe like 30, 31. I had a series of dates at the Wigmore Hall, and um, they had already been set up, but I wasn't sure what I wanted to do. So it was TBA to be announced, you know, in the beginning on, on the schedule. They finally put it in. And the, the Clavier Ubunk can be done, the parts that concern the piano or the you know, a keyboard, a non-organ, let's say this, can be done in three concerts. Mm -hmm. So that included, of course, the six partitas, the French overture, Italian concerto, and the, the um, Goldberg variations with, as well, the four duets of the third part of the Clavier Ubunk. And those four duets are like glorified two-part inventions. So they're fabulous pieces. Again, they're underplayed by people. They're wonderful, wonderful stuff. So that was maybe the first... No, that was not the first cycle that I did, but that was the first Bach cycle yeah. that I did. I had played all the Brahms piano works the previous year. <laughs> yeah. And uh, or you, it's hard to say which are all the Brahms solo piano works, because a, a lot of them were transcriptions, and I did not play all the transcriptions, yeah. but that was a five-concert cycle, which I also did here to a great extent um, in Mini about five, six years ago. But I excluded a couple of pieces. Uh, the Brahms Paganini variations are something I played quite a lot when I was younger, but I, 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 it hurts my hand now because I don't have big hands. Yeah. And it really hurts my hands to play, the, to play the pieces. I know that sounds like a good excuse, but it's true. So I left them out. I left them out of the cycle. So. I came to one of your concerts, the mostly Brahms concert. Which one? In 2000. The one where I left out the Brahms Paganini. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah. I don't I don't remember which one it was, but it was in 2013. You played something by, I, I can't remember the program now, but it was uh, Brahms and there was one piece by Schumann, but yeah, I don't remember. I, I included Schumann in the cycle simply because uh, even though there is difference, it's night and day. I mean, I think that 
Schumann obviously influenced Brahms very much by just putting him on the map, and I think I wanted to show the differences of the two, because people always associate them, don't they? Yeah. And Brahms with Clara Schumann, well, yeah. that's a different association, but still with the Schumann family. Of course. And I wanted to show that maybe they are very, very different. And, uh, and the truth is that I prefer Schumann's music. As much as I love Brahms, I think... It's an awful thing to say. You can scrub that, but <laughs> but 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 I but I actually I think I think Schumann's piano music um, for me is as a total package is greater. Yeah. I mean, I, there are so many pieces of Brahms that I adore, but some of the work I don't really care for. Oddly enough, the three piano sonatas, the early pieces. I know I'm going to come under fire for saying this, but I don't really care for them except like the slow movement of the F minor sonata is a great piece and. You know, Brahms, we know the story that he was afraid to write a symphony until he was 43 years old, I think. Yeah. As a result of it, he put all of that young testosterone into these big pieces, yeah. the first, Opus 1, 2, and 5, and they're immature. Yeah. There's some great moments in them, but the writing itself, it, it's like trying to be bigger than you really, really yeah. are. Um, and and I, I just don't buy it now. Yeah. When I was a kid, I liked it, but yeah. I don't buy it now. I... Um, I think his greatest pieces are the short pieces that he wrote later in his life, which he almost didn't write. Yeah. You know that story. I mean, he heard Richard Mühlfeld, the great bar uh, clarinetist in the Meiningen Orchestra, and this was 1890. You know, Brahms would have been 57 years old, and he had more or less hung up his, uh, you know, whatever they say, his jacket for, for composing. He was going to have a nice life uh, going out with his friends every day in the Vienna woods and having uh, uh, his red wine and his cigar, and that was it, you know? And he heard Mühlfeld, and that 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 completely brought him to life again. He uh, Composition-wise, he composed, of course, the clarinet trio, the clarinet sonatas, the clarinet quintet. Mm. And then, thank God for... Uh, you know, Mr. Mufet, he um, gave us the, the, the last four great uh, opuses of short pieces, Opus 116, 17, 18, and 19. And they are almost to a, to a piece, I would say. Yes, they're, they're, they're very great works. But um, that's an interesting trajectory, Brahms. Yeah. Interesting trajectory. You mentioned your teacher, uh, Eleanor Sokolov. Yeah. And you studied at Curtis, at mm -hmm. Julia, at Tanglewood. What are some memorable, maybe, experiences or moments of those times in the young, oh boy, young Craig Shepherd? You want to be here for a year, huh? <laughs> I know. I mean, it's. I went to Juilliard to study with Sasha Gornitsky for three years. Uh -huh. I left Philadelphia after three years at Curtis, and I could have stayed longer, and that had nothing to do with uh, Mrs. Sokoloff. Um, it had to do more with the fact that I'm from Philadelphia, yeah. and I simply wanted to spread my wings. And I knew instinctively after high school, when I was 17, I graduated when I was 17, I realized that I wasn't quite ready for the big, bad world of New York. Yeah. Three years later, I said to myself, listen, buddy, you got no choice. Get, get in there, you know. So I went to New York. I, I, I auditioned for Gordon Nitsky, got in. It was, a, it was a great time. We were, The first year we were at the old school, which is now the Manhattan School, mm -hmm. then we moved down to Lincoln Center in 1969. You know when you're a young kid, you don't realize to the extent that you're rubbing shoulders with some really great people. I remember um, a woman named Renée Longy. She, uh, I think, in fact, the Longy School, L-O-N-G-Y, yeah. is, is named after either her or her family. Really? Well, she came over here when she was a young woman, but she was actually, supposedly, at the famous uh, um, riot that took place in Paris when, she, when the Sacre du Printemps was in 1913. She was there as wow. a young girl. That she claimed she was. <laughs> and But the point I'm saying is that I never, she, she taught solfege basically at Juilliard. I never studied with her because I'd already passed out of solfege, but she took a liking to me and I, I thought she was just a wonderful lady, oh. you know, elderly lady at the time, probably about my age now. And she, she um, and I used to travel on the bus together down to school and we would frequently, we would just be sitting there laughing or doing this or that or whatever. And she, and I had no idea to the extent of how great she was. Yeah. I mean, you know, at the time, the, you, when you meet people like this, you just sort of say, oh, well, hi. And, yeah. <laughs> you know, um, yeah, there were just wonderful, um, 
wonderful moments. I mean, at Tanglewood, I was there for two summers and um, I formed, some, you know, you form friendships that, again, without realizing, like Gene Drucker of the Emerson Quartet. Yeah. Uh, Which you've collaborated with. Uh, several times, yeah. but G Gene is, is four and a half years younger than me. He's like a, like a younger brother. Yeah. We, be, we became really close friends and we played a lot of Juilliard subsequently. He introduced me to Phil Setzer, who's the other violinist of the quartet. And uh, we've remained friends ever since. Um, and then I went to, to Marlborough for two summers, and that's actually where I met Mary Pariah. Mm -hmm. um, the first time I'd heard about Pariah for several years in Philadelphia. Um, you know, I had a friend who used to exaggerate everything, and he said, you don't know who Mary Pariah is. He plays every single piece in the chamber music repertoire. And I thought, wow, you know, when you're 17, you're really yeah. impressed by this. Um, and uh, then I heard um, uh, Murray at the Marlboro Festival and thought, wow, you know, this is really, really something. Uh, but I mean, again, you know, you, the, you, you meet these people and form friendships. Richard Good was there. We were, became very, very good friends. Um, just a whole bunch of people. Um, at the Granary Quartet were there. I knew them without becoming close friends. But, you know, you, you, these are people that you... And, and you learn from them. I mean, I, I would listen assiduously to the Guarneri and to all the string quartets and to the singers. They brought Benito Valente, wonderful soprano. These are the experiences, you know, you remember from a kid. You, yeah. you, you, it's all learning. In fact, life is learning. Yeah. Like this is, uh, yeah, I mean... Does that sort of give you a little picture it's of great. the early... It's great, but you know what I want to know is having such a successful career, as a performing artist, yes. as a pianist in London for 20 years. Yeah. Why teach? Why? I mean, I've taught since I was a kid. I adore teaching, my God. In fact, again, it's something I learned such a... If, if my students learn as much from teaching as I learn from them, yeah. I'd be a happy man. I think they probably do. I'm hoping they do. But but uh, teaching is, is such a... It, it's it, You're passing on what you've... What's been passed on to you. And you're doing it, obviously, in, in your own way, because everybody has a different way of approaching things. Um, I'll make a little digression here. You know, one thing which is always uh, that I've learned over the years, I think when I was a kid, I used to come out on stage and think that everybody knew exactly every single note I was playing, and it, it, it frightened me if I played a wrong note or did something bad. You know, I wanted to crawl off stage and everything. Well, now, of course, I realize that very few in the audience know exactly what's going on. Yeah. Every person in that audience has got his or her set of ears, and they all hear what yeah. you're doing differently. Yeah. They process it differently. And that's gratifying at the end of the day, because if you have 800 people in the audience, you're going to have 800 opinions of how you play. It's, and I tell this to my students, too, because the students are they're, you know, very vulnerable, and they worry about getting on stage. And I say, just go out and do what you want to do, hopefully with a little bit of input put from what I've helped them with. Because it's, you can, you can only put your best foot forward that yeah. way, you, and you have to, yeah. you have to. Um, you know, teaching is, is, I know I really, and I enjoy also getting to know the students and getting to know their aspirations and trying to help them um, if I can. And um, also telling them the times when I am not able to help and they've just got to do it on their own. And I can think of that from when I was younger too, again, you, one brings things back to one's own experience. I mean, there were times when I had quite a bit of help from people, even sometimes that I didn't know. I had no idea it was going on behind my maybe behind my back, and that's probably a good thing. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, there were many, many moments where I had to learn to do those things for myself, yeah. and that was even harder because you, you know, I think. It's not good to be given too much. Yeah. It's not good. It's not. You need to learn to fight in a positive way, in a good way, and not be, you know, nasty about it, whatever. But you yeah. need to learn for your own self-esteem. Yeah. You need to learn. Yeah. And I can tell you one thing. Here, I'm rather rambling on about oh, different ways, but it. you know, one thing which has bothered me about this profession, um, about classical music in general is that the older I get, particularly, the more I realize we're just a small niche in the world. For me, it's, it, for, 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 for both of us, it's a very, very important niche. It's, it's our life. It's yeah. our livelihood, and it's our life. Yeah. And I wouldn't 
have chosen anything else, although I think I probably could have gone in different directions, but I won't go there. I, you know, a lot of musicians could have. But um, when I see people doing things in medicine and in, 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 in genomes and, um, and in public health and friends of ours here in Seattle, that, and I think they're affecting, or you know, the, the Gates Foundation, yeah. for example, I see that they're affecting the world in such a positive way yeah. at a much broader level than either you or I will ever be able to do. And that does bother me sometimes. It's it's not because I want the recognition from it, it's because I want to die knowing that I've helped people. Yeah. And that, uh, you know, and that it, it is, is bothersome sometimes. Do you, do you have that same? Uh, I do have that same thing. And I always think, why is music important? Why do you think music is important? Or is it important? Oh, it is completely. <laughs> but but I, I'm not so sure I can, can tell you why it's important. That's, that's interesting. I should be able to give a dissertation on that. Um, you've caught me off by surprise. Why is it important? I mean, it is who I am. But it's not the complete me. Um, it, music is, it's important. I think classical music is very, very important for people to be exposed to, but not just music, I think all the classical arts. Yeah. I think the art world, you know, the, the world of pictures yeah. and painting and the world of dance, the world of theater, the world, but, but really in the best sense of the world, word, and of course then to, 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 to wade through all the nonsense that's being put out there, like on YouTube, where you can just bring up anything, and sometimes the students come and don't even know whom they've listened yeah. to, and you have to guide them in that way. But I think it's very, very important. I think it's important for the human soul. I mean, the um, a lot of negativity is going on in our planet right now, and we don't want to go there, do we? But we both know what I'm talking yeah. about. And um, I think this is a, a way of balancing that and at times it's those thoughts that keep me going it's not it completely I mean I just go to the piano and play a few notes um, if I was gonna say if they're in tune that's a bad joke but you know I, I play I just play just a few notes of anything and immediately I'm I, I said this is why I'm doing it because it's so beautiful yeah. and it's to me at least meaningful and I guess I suppose we as performers have to be able to turn that around so that yeah. it's meaningful to others. Yeah. And you know, uh, go, expounding on this, I remember years ago a um, having a phone call with a family member. I was in London, and it was my older brother, and we, he was in Philadelphia. This is about two in the morning over in London. And I said, uh, you know, well, I. Just didn't do. He said. Well, he said you sound a little down. I said, Well, I am. I said the last few concerts didn't go that well. He said, Well, why didn't they go very well? I said, Well, you know, this and this and this. I started giving excuses. Maybe I hadn't practiced as much as I should and everything. And he stopped me mid sentence. He said, Listen, buddy. He said, If you, if if I get up in the morning, my, my brother's a businessman. If I get up in the morning and barely say hi to Judy and the kids, the kids are all grown with their own kids now. But you know. If I barely say hi and get out the door, have meetings, you know, whatever, the whole day and come home, have a shower, wolf my dinner down and barely have the time to get to your concert on time. If you don't deliver when I'm there, yeah. you know, like that. And that was that was a very profound moment for me. And I thought to myself, yes, <laughs> you're absolutely right. I cannot ask anybody, anybody to come to my concert if I'm not going to give 150 percent. I can, you know. And at the same time, not only that, but many of them are going to come maybe being dragged there, maybe not wishing they were some, doing something else or having had a bad day or something like that. So I've got to give them something that makes them feel better, makes them think better, makes them f yeah, feel better, maybe deeper, whatever, maybe even lighter. Do you know, it's, 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 it's a great responsibility yeah. to be on stage. You know, the first time I met you, I right away, even though I didn't know much about you, I realized that you are a very inspiring person because you connected with me right away, even even though I was within just a couple of minutes passing through in the hallways. Mm -hmm. uh, what inspires know. you today? How do you have the energy that you have to just constantly be on top of it, whether it's talking to people <laughs> in the hallway or playing a concert? I still remember your concert, the one I came to in 2013 or 14. You played it memorized. 
Well, that's that, that, that that's a given. You know, what I mean, when you, you memorization is something you learn when you're a kid. It's like a muscle, mm -hmm. and it's like anything in life. If you don't use it, you lose it. You know? So you have to you have you have to keep it up. You have to. Um, there are some of my colleagues now in my age. I'm going to be seventy in a few months, and in some and some of my colleagues. Uh, are using music. One of my teachers, Clifford Curzon, over in London, used music already in his 50s. Uh, and um, he just felt more comfortable with it. And the truth is, I don't think it would have mattered one way or the other. His performances were very inspired, you know. That's what mattered. Um, I still have this probably misguided conception that if I, uh, if I don't, if I use the music, maybe I haven't worked enough or have, don't really know it well enough. Now, I think maybe I'm being too hard on myself when I think of the Shostakovich Preludes and Fugues, which are two hours and 20 minutes, and I'm doing them from memory yeah. at, at the moment. Um, you know, but I just feel, I feel like I've done my homework, you yeah. know. Um, but, but I always did, the, the programs that you heard compared to the Shostakovich were, were much less, yeah. you know, I mean... The only reason I know the timings of these things is when they get put on CDs and you see timings all the time. But for example, my recent Chopin concert, I did the two, uh, the second and third sonata and the, and the F minor fantasy and three of the mazurkas of Opus 59, the, the, the three mazurkas, uh, that was all of 72 minutes. Wow. That was a whole concert. And yet the, uh, the uh, Shostakovich, the first half alone is 64 minutes and the second half is 78, I yeah. think. You know, um, you just don't stop to think of it. You you do it. That's, uh, why why would memorization have been such a? Don't most pianists you see have to? You, I mean, for solo concerts, don't they? They do, I guess, yeah. for the most part. But I'm just saying, you know, you're just an all around kind of a person. That's what's inspiring. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I really that I don't know. I you mean, have I'm, students I'm just, and and many young people that follow you and listen to you, what advice would you give them? Just open up to everything around you and then know how to sift through it so that you have time left for your work, yeah. <laughs> which is really the most important thing. I would say also read a lot. Yeah. Um, I do read a lot, but I read a lot of different things. I think friends of mine would joke and say, yes, you read Facebook. Well, I do probably a little too much of that sometimes, but I read a lot. I read a lot in foreign languages and I do, um, I, I read different material from a lot of what my colleagues read. And, um, but it's, it's, it's a constant thing, you know, it's, it's input, which you sort of digest and then you, you give it out to the world in your own particular way. I mean, yeah. you know, that's, so I think reading is very important. I think it's. I think exercise is important. I try to get. We live in a very hilly area here, so we try to get out for a walk yeah. every day. Um, it's like your own gymnasium in your backyard, yeah. you know. What other extra? What other uh, uh, advice should I give? I'm, uh, what do you sort? Of, are you angling at something in particular? No, this it was whatever. Whatever you think, you know. I mean, you have all the experience here. I don't know. <laughs> I mean, well, you know. It's also funny with the st with students because one has to be very careful not to get the students enjoy my stories and they whatever, but there are sometimes and you just have to concentrate right on what, not only just on the music which is obvious, but on very specific things in the music, and it also depends upon the age of the student. With young kids, sometimes I can be very detailed that we don't get past, uh, you know the first page basically in an hour practically yeah. on the other hand i remember having a student come to me one of the doctoral students several years ago and said something about um you don't say enough to me and i thought well that's interesting i i said you know you are in your late 20s and maybe it's time that you stood on your own two feet yeah. and there, there's a psychology behind it well i but i said if you really want we can do that well he was doing a concerto uh, i don't want to say which one uh, and uh we went through it, I said, didn't let him get two notes before I stopped him every single yeah. time, you know. And I said, now, is that what you wanted? Because I said, I think we had a good lesson. And he said, oh, well, maybe we should have a combination of the both. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and I think it's a little, it's very hard. Once you've opened that, I mean, use the Indian word, the chakra, whatever it is yeah. in, in my thinking, in my feeling like that, whatever, once you've opened that, 
it's probably pretty much boom, like like a, yeah. like a, like an arrow one way or the other, yeah. you know. And it's not that I sit back and just you know in my chair in my office and just you know uh, twiddle my thumbs while they're playing, and not at all. But I I I I do like them to learn what is what is the purpose of a teacher? The teacher is the purpose of the teacher is to is to get you to listen properly to yourself. Ultimately, then you say what's properly. Well, you have to teach them that. You have to teach what to listen. Or how to how to listen, and then how to do it, and you really can't do anything beyond that. And once you have got them on that wavelength, they're on their own. Which is why I think after three four years, the kids are going to hear basically the same thing from me. I'm sorry, even even the greatest teachers, I think, are not going to be they're not going to change their tone too much. And I think it's time to move on. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. You've collaborated with some well-known conductors, I read. Yeah, I have. I've been lucky, yeah. And I, you could pick which one you want to talk about, but maybe some stories, if, if there are any. I know, you know, sometimes collaborations are within a week, and you, you get there, you play the concerto, but any that come to mind from, you know, MTT, you... you well, Chelsea, and... Chelsea Thomas, I knew as a, as a young man because I won a competition in L.A., which is the, I think they still have the Young Musicians Foundation. Mm -hmm. And, um, he was the conductor of the Young Musicians and, and Michael yeah. was the conductor yeah. of the Young Musicians Foundation. So I played Prokofiev three with him. Subsequently, I did um, I did a Tchaikovsky with him in the London Symphony uh, when he was the conductor over there. Tchaikovsky one. Um, and <laughs> there's a, th this is something I'm embarrassed about, but I'll tell you anyway. Um, he asked me to play a series of concerts when he was the conductor of the, of the Buffalo Symphony in 1974. And he, he called me and said, I'd like you to do Bartok 1. Now at the time, don't ask me why, because I adore the piece now, but at the time I didn't care for the piece. I probably didn't care for it because I probably didn't understand it, but whatever, I was, I was right after the Leeds competition. And so I said, I, I, I said, Michael, I don't really care for the piece that much. He said, there was this dead silence. And then he, he said, okay, well, I'll, I'll get back to you. And I thought I probably had burned myself in the bridges there. Well, he did call back a couple of days later. And he said, well, look, I've got Aaron Copeland coming next year to the, and he needs somebody for his piano concerto. Would you like to do that with Mr. Copeland? And I said, well, did you need to ask? You know, I was delighted. And now, the truth is, in retrospect, uh, although I played sub Bartok one subsequently, but I would love to have done that with Michael, and I never did it. But the connection to, to Copeland also was wonderful. Wow. I mean, that was, I played with Copeland in the concerts in Buffalo, and then the following year, when he had his 75th birthday, which everybody celebrated all over the world, um, at the BBC asked me to play, the, play at the proms, which I had already done a prom before that, but they asked me to play his concerto at the proms. Wow. And, yeah. And I also played it on on with the London Symphony on on television while he was wow. there. So we did, we got, got a lot of mileage out of that yeah, connection. Yeah. And he was an awfully nice gentleman. He really was. And boy, talk about somebody widely read and uh, a great intellectual. Wow, really wonderful man. So that was. And but since I'm talking about composers um, in the past, I I had a. Samuel Barber I had met in 1968 because his partner, John Carlo Minotti, gave the commencement address at Curtis, which was my uh, last year there, and I was one of the ones, one of the marshals who opened the door for when John Carlo walked wow. on, 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 whatever. Wow. So afterward, the, um, the lady at the Curtis, a Mrs. Braun, who was his husband was a famous doctor in Philly, she um, introduced me and my colleague Daniel Heifetz, the violinist, mm -hmm. to, uh, to to Minotti and Barbara, who had come down, Sam Barbara had come down from New York. So that was it. And then, um, we, but I had just played my Curtis Hall recital, my now the Field Hall, and had done the Barbara Sonata and had a big success with this, the Piano Sonata. So he heard about this and he said, why don't you come and play it for me? And I said, well, you know, gulp. <laughs> anyway, that was put on hold. I went to Juilliard. And for some reason, uh, suddenly I got a call from my mother in Philadelphia, and she said, uh, uh, Samuel Barber has just called. I said, what? She said, he would like you to come and play for him. I said, well, that's very nice. And it turns out I got this letter, and he said that he'd been looking all around for me, and somehow um, he came to a dead end when they said that I didn't exist. <laughs> 
So then he called up Curtis and got my parents' number, you see, and that's it. So I went and played for him, ultimately. It was early 1969, I think it was, in his place on East 64th Street. I played the majority of the sonata, not the entire thing, but we actually sat and talked a lot at the time. But it was fascinating because I said, you know, Mr. Barber, I don't do this quite the way you said in the music. I mean, I, I feel a little differently here. I hesitated. He was a very, he was very kind. Um, other people might have locked my head off, you know. So, <laughs> so, he, so he said, well, what, 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 what do you feel? Show me and everything. He said, well, you know, it was something in the last movement I remember in the fugue. And he said, uh, well, look, when I, when I was writing the sonata, I had a certain idea in mind, but this is really quite interesting, yeah, you know. Yeah. And he really meant it. So yeah. it, this shows, I think, that our slavish um, adherence to the score um, is, is it's sometimes misplaced. We, right. we should absolutely try to do what the composer intended, but you know what? The composer's intentions could have changed yeah. over time. Yeah. I mean, an example, now I'm going off on another tangent. I just last month I was in Basel at the Paul Soccer Collection with a, a manuscript that Shostakovich wrote of the Preludes and Fugues for his um, student, student quote unquote, Galina Ustvolskaya, who also happened to be have a ten year affair with him. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but you knew because of that, writing he it was a handwritten score of the Preludes and Fugues. You knew damn well this was going to be something which was meaningful because he you know and boy, the differences, I'm sorry, from the score that even from the score I had seen a photocopy of his of his uh, manuscript in Paris last year, and the differences are quite significant. Wow. In fact, enough to, 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 to drive me nuts. And the fact is that also it, it's opened up a whole bunch of cans of worms, which in a way, well, I don't want to say I wished I hadn't seen them, but the fact is it shows that composers have second thoughts yeah. on these pieces. Yeah. I don't think Beethoven to my knowledge, ever did this with anything. Once he was finished, he was finished. But other composers have come back. I mean, Rachman enough with his first concerto, uh, and then many others, you know. And and um, the so that, that's interesting, isn't it? Um, even even dynamics were different in the Shostakovich, um, and certainly phrasings were different. And a couple of notes, which. Really, there's something in the third prelude, uh, the G major prelude, which is still driving me nuts. And because he had something very ironic, but it was a note that sounded like it stuck out in the left hand. But boy, it's good because it, because it's very ironic. And then he corrects it the second yeah. time around. He does the same phrase twice. In the Ustvolskaya manuscript, he does the does it the same way both times. So he takes the irony out of it. Yeah. And um, you know, that someday if I see Shostakovich, I'm going to tell him I don't like that. <laughs> you know? I mean, have you ever had yourself, you know, when you, if, if you ever had a chance to meet with composers, you have a whole list of questions yeah. you want to ask them? Yeah, yeah, many times. Yeah, I mean... Even yeah. some of the University of Washington composers whose pieces I've, I've conducted. Yes. And, um, yeah, yeah it's, do it's... Do they know? Do they know the answer to your question? Sometimes they do and sometimes they don't. Yeah. Yeah. And it's really interesting you brought that up because, I mean, in the piano performance world and, and in the conducting, coming from my perspective, there's so much fighting happening, you know. This is not what this composer meant. This is not what they meant. But these composers are people, too. And just the example that you brought is a, is a good well, one. Listen, Shostakovich was a fantastic pianist. Now, he had a lot of pressure on him, as we know from different quarters. But when he went in 1953 into the recording studio and recorded 18 of the 24 Preludes and Fugues, just as an example, there's one of them. He starts off, it's the D major fugue, and he starts off at a so-called proper tempo, which is what he put in the score. And by the end of the piece, he's rushed so much that he's doing twice the speed. Yeah. Now, you know, he probably just lost it. He probably just lost his nerve or something. He might have been in one of his, he was a, he was a very nervous character. Of course, of course. He probably, maybe he wanted to get out of there sooner. Maybe, yeah. maybe, maybe somebody came... If, you know, in the window behind the screen that he suddenly thought, oh my God, there's somebody from the KGB. I don't know what made yeah. him do that. But what I'm saying is that there are many places in his score which don't correspond to what he wrote. Yeah. Uh, there, there are a couple of notes. I went over this with my recording engineer, uh, Dmitry Lipai, of the symphony. Um, and there's a note in the F-sharp minor uh, fugue, which Shostakovich plays differently in the bass. It's a very slow fugue. It's basically a Jewish lament. And he, you know, had many Jewish friends, and he took this lament and made it into a fugue. And, and that note 
when he plays it in the studio, I love that note, but it's not in his score. Yeah. So I was, you know, you go back and forth, should I play the note, should I not? Now people, you know, all the bazillions of notes the pianists play, people would, anybody listening to this, if they're still listening, would probably be saying, you know, you're going crazy over a simple F sharp or a G sharp or an E sharp, rather, uh, on either side of the F sharp. I said, well, yes, I mean, because I really do want to do what he intended. But what he played was something different, yeah. you know. I, I, but you see, if I played it that way, we ended up putting in the, the G sharp instead or whatever, the one that's in the printed score. Because yeah. if I had done it differently, then I would have colleagues saying, "Oh, he can't read music," you know. <laughs> oh, I, I admit to being to being sometimes making choices like that, you know, arbitrary choices yeah. based on uh, not wanting to offend people sometimes. But uh, I, I shouldn't probably, but I do. Yeah. Yeah. What inspires you to keep going? You've done this for so many years now. What what makes you wake up in the morning and want to practice or do another recording, get out and tour and perform? I don't know. I really don't know. I mean, I, I it would be nice just to sit back, wouldn't it? And, um, I feel very guilty when I take time off. You know, it's funny. I, I, can, I can waste time as much as anybody, I think. Sometimes I think even more. But when, but suddenly it'll get to a point and I think, you son of a gun, you've been given this time on this planet to do something and you're not doing it. You know, I, it, you're, you're not fulfilling whatever it is. I, guess, I think there's something in that, you yeah. know. I, I guess maybe I haven't really... If one is given a mission, I think everybody, not just, you know, people who have a public image, whatever, everybody has a gift, everybody has a mission, a mission, and everybody's given this life. And, and if you don't spend your time doing what is, is uh, what you're meant to do or what you've chosen to do, and therefore I guess you're meant to do it, I, I, I guess I can't really answer the question. Yeah. But it's, I don't know what keeps Well, I have going. another big question for you, and you've spent again a long career in music so you know the waves that it's gone through a lot of people talk about you know the classical music world is not doing well orchestras are closing down not many people are coming to concerts where is our future in the world of classical music i don't know i don't know i do know that right now we're very dependent upon all the talent come from coming from china let's face it you know they're they're filling our music schools they are when you go to china um, uh, they say that minimally 30 million kids are doing piano there, so if you, I think it's even more than that. So if you, t if you take 1% of 1%, you're still talking about, is it, is it 30,000 or, or, or maybe 3,000? Let's just say even 3,000 because I'm bad at math. And let's just say, say 3,000 kids every year are, are graduating from conservatories playing Bach and Beethoven and Brahms. Not all of them are going to be good, but you're going to have a Yuja or a Long Long amongst them. You sure as hell yeah. are, you know, and that's, it, it, that's encouraging. So, in fact, maybe the future of classical music resides in China. Um, I think, but then I read something recently about the fact that opera in Germany is still alive and well because of all the subsidies that they get from the German government for all these regional opera houses. And even in smaller towns, the opera houses are very much a focal point. A lot of American singers are flocking there again. They did in the 70s and 80s, and then it went through a sort of fallow period, and they're going over again. Yeah. So that's wonderful to hear. I know that the problems it's going through in this country, but then again, you're up against a lot of popular culture. And, and I, it's, it's funny, I really do live in a bubble, I guess, because I've never had much of a uh, <clears throat> connection to popular culture. Maybe when I was a kid, a little bit, because you can hardly avoid it with your, yeah. with your peer group. You know, uh, I grew up in a in a regular suburban area. I say regular, but it was a suburban area with uh, a lot of friends. There were 950 in my high school class when we graduated, and a lot of them have gone on to do wonderful things. But the, but this was a mixture of everybody, you know. And you 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 mix with the kids, and you hear this, or you you know you're just subjected to a lot of different things of popular culture. But since the age of 17, when I've concentrated in in our profession. Uh, uh, it, I guess that's fallen by the wayside. I mean, this should make you laugh. Do you know that I had no idea? Well, I had heard of them, but I really had very little idea of who the Grateful Bread, uh, the Grateful uh, the Dead were. That's a, a, a slip of the tongue. Is there something down the road here called the Grateful Bread, <laughs> which of course is a you know down in 70th Street, which is which is a takeoff on the Grateful Dead. But Jerry Garcia and stuff, I had 
I had never ever listened to him. I think I listened to a clip on YouTube and thought, thank you very much, it's not me. But it wouldn't have been me when I was a kid either. Yeah. And I, I'm sorry, to, you know, people think, well, you, you know, you've got your head in the clouds. Well, I don't care what they think. The fact is it doesn't mean anything to me. Yeah. It just doesn't mean anything yeah. to me. Um, you know, um, and and here this icon of American culture, you yeah. know. Uh, even Ben and Jerry's named, uh, you know, was it Cherry's Garcia yeah. instead of Jerry Garcia. Yeah. I mean, I love Cherry's Garcia. But, you know, um, so where, where classical music is headed, I, I can't say. I mean, um, I can't say the audiences are less. The audiences are graying, but, you know, something over in China, they're making a point of having their young parents who are in their 20s bring their little 9 and 10 year olds and you have the average audience age in China couldn't be more than 20. Wow. And and they're learning how to, you know, uh, it used to be probably 15, 20 years ago, they made a lot of noise, but they're learning that they need to concentrate, that they need to turn their cell phones off. Um, I remember a concert of a colleague in Shanghai about 10 years ago, where all these piano students at the conservatory, these young girls, most of them, were in the front row on their on their phones doing texting or whatever like this. And I, I wanted to say something, but I was a guest, so I couldn't. Um, I think that's changed. Yeah. I know, for example, in Beijing, in the famous, the big, the National Concert Hall called The Egg, mm -hmm. uh, they have people uh, like, uh, you know, guards on duty who, who will walk up to you and tell you to turn your phone off. Yeah. Um, so they're making people pay attention, and they're they're building audiences that way. Um, so I, I guess the future must be over there. I mean, we had you know after World War II in the '60s, '70s, and even into the '80s, we had the Japanese um, who were taking to classical music as if they had uh, invented it. And then you had uh, shortly thereafter, or about the same time, the Koreans. Yeah. And there, it's still very important in, in Korea and Japan, yeah. but China is the big new uh, thing. And Europeans, you know something, uh, Tigran, Europeans have never let up, although they've got problems. I know they do in Great Britain. Music is no longer in the schools the way it was when I was a kid, which is the same over here, of course. I mean, gosh, when I was a kid, we had a school orchestra. I was the president of our choir for two years, and... And the choir, chorus, choir, whatever, was a major subject. Yeah. Uh, and and, uh, and we loved it. We loved it. Where Where is all this harmonization to get? You know, people learn by harmonizing also to harmonize with each other. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's not just singing brings people together because it's joyous. Yeah. And it comes from within the body. It's like dancing. It's a joyous thing. It's the, kind of a different sort of thing when you're putting your hands on a keyboard. But it's, you know... I don't know where the future. Where, where do you think the future lies? I'm curious. I am you're positive. Much younger. I am positive, and I and I know that it's going to turn around. I really, uh, the, the new generation of young artists, I think, bring something new and fresh to the table. Uh, I mean, the past generations have done great. What they've you're had. You're not insulting me. Um, saying that. Go on. But but I, you know, new perspective. It seems like new music, which is something I, I, of course, the past generations have done well, and they've really programmed new music mm -hmm. in the past. But I think the new generations are finding new ways and maybe maybe alternatives. You know, some of them I don't agree with, but the alternative venues and new mm -hmm. places, and so so. The, well, there my, are, my, my my former student, uh, now former, just he just graduated, Brooks uh, Tran. Um, it has something called the Parnassus group. Yeah, you know, of course. And, and, and you know these these young young people are very very inventive, and as you say, you know they're they're inventing new ways yeah. of getting things out there, yeah. and trying to get uh, well whatever audiences and building audiences. Yeah. Yes, yeah, yeah. So uh, you you wouldn't insult my generation by saying that. <laughs> I mean, I'm I'm stuck. I'm stuck in the sense that I I'm. Well, I mean, I have done a fair bit of contemporary music over the years, but. I'm basically in the, you know, the periods before 1960, although having said that, in my New York debut in 72, I did play the Berio Sequenza 4, wow. and that was only six years old. Wow. And in fact, it was probably the best thing I played on the program. I didn't, don't think I liked the way I played the rest of the program. <laughs> but, but, you know, it's, it's still something I'm quite proud of. But, you know, having said that, it's, um, I'm still, I guess because of my, my foundation of Bach, it's it's what I do love, and I and I and I leave the other two younger people who do it probably much better. Yeah, you know, and 
I have a few last questions, quick yeah. ones. Yeah. Life changing musical moment. Maybe hearing Horowitz for the first time live. Um, he met the expectations and more. I remember in Carnegie Hall thinking I was sitting way up in the, you know, the second balcony, um, and the sound sort of enveloped you. I mean, it came over. Remember, there were old. You, you, you were too young to know this, but in the television in the old days, there were ads about L and M cigarettes, where the, the the smoke came over, under, around, and through you. You know, this was the the way I felt about Horowitz's sound. It just enveloped me. It was. It, I remember the thrill it gave me. The first time I ever heard Maria Callas. I know now more than ever, I'm, I'm willing to, uh, to admit to myself the flaws in her voice, but the fact is that she affected me deeper than any singer ever has, practically. Um, and that she was able to create more colors with her voice, which is probably one reason she lost it. You know, she, um, and it just affected me very deeply. Um, I'm sure there are plenty of others. I, uh, the first time, uh, is a colleague, you know, first time I heard Murray Pariah playing, um, it was the F minor um, Mendelssohn piano quartet of Opus One, and I can still remember the way he played the opening of the last movement. It was, it, it, I, I, it, my mouth was open literally. I yeah. thought, my God, you know, you can only be grateful for moments yeah. like that. It's, um, I mean, I've had other moments with, with. With, with Murray and with other colleagues since then, yes, which have been wonderful, but these are seminal moments, aren't they? Because yeah. you think, my God, music can be like that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, anyway. What's on your playlist now? If you were, you know, if we were to turn your computer on, what's playing, if anything? <laughs> right now? Well, I'm going through fingerings of the Shostakovich, <laughs> one, of the pr one of the fugues right now in my head. I think that's going on while we're talking. Is that what you're aiming at? Is that well, no, just it's something that you would listen to, a recording that is on right now, that you are listening oh, to, or the last hard. thing that you heard. It's hard to say, because, I mean, I, I listen to so many different things. If I see something up on Facebook, you know, because my, my, my colleagues and friends put up really interesting things sometimes, I'll listen to it. Although, God knows, there's not enough time to listen to a fraction of it. But I can't say. I can't say. I can't limit it to any... One particular. Well, I have my last question. It's my favorite question. What does Craig Shepard do outside of music, non musical? I read, I, I exercise, I take walks, um, I meet with friends huh. sometimes. I don't know what do I do. You know, my partner, Greg, and I love to travel. Uh -huh. You mentioned this when you came in the door. Yeah. Right? We, we do travel. Usually it's for musical reasons, but we joke since he's heard me before, he doesn't come to my concerts, he just comes afterward, and then we have a few days of, you know, we did that in Switzerland. Uh, I had been teaching in Israel, and then we um, we came, we met in Zurich, and met up with old friends for the weekend, had a wonderful weekend there, then I went to Basel and saw this manuscript of Shostakovich, and then we spent three days hiking up in the mountains, which was, I hadn't done for 35 years since we wow. in, in, in the Alps. That was wow. great. That was just, it, it clears the mind, mm -hmm. you know, it really does. Um, so I think I would do more hiking here in Seattle if I had the time. Yeah. I would. What do you do in your spare time? I, I'm working on this podcast right now. <laughs> right. <laughs> and uh, okay. it's, it's fun because I'm really surprised that people like yourself who are very well accomplished and have done so much in the world want to sit down and talk to me and well, we've known each other but uh, from the but before but there's also other people who I just email and they respond because I've, I've liked you their know work people and, like if you've noticed it, it, I'm, I'm no different people like to talk about themselves and if you want somebody to like you you get them to talk about themselves huh. <laughs> unfortunately this is an interview about me so I've done 90 percent of the talking and I apologize but um, I think this is why you have no trouble getting people coming to you, yeah. because people like to share their experiences. Yeah. I'm, I'm flattered that you think that my experiences are worth hearing. I mean, I, you know, could go on a lot, but, but it's, it's, it's um, you know, I'm, I'm flattered that you ask, actually. No, so. it's, it's an honor, and I, and I love what you do, and I'm inspired by you, and, right. and um, hopefully we'll have you back on at some point. Yeah. I, I, I'm curious about your podcast. How long has this been going on? For maybe five or six months. Well, I've done, I think this is 36. Or and what gave you the idea? Well, first, 
it started because I want to talk about things that have bothered me in the classical music world, you know. And it kind of turned into talking to people who have the same feelings or just talking to people and learning from them their experiences. Because I haven't done nearly as much as most of my guests. And it's just nice to sit, you know, talk to them and learn from them and record it and put it out there for people to listen to. But uh, one that comes to mind is, uh, you know, I've even though I'm a conductor and I there's so many great people that I've studied with, you know, I've always said that I just think that music directors are way overpaid for the amount of work they do. And you do? I think so. Compared oh. to orchestral musicians. Well, okay. I'm just thinking of uh, compared to sports stars. Well, I, I, I really wish the musical world was, you know, had so much money that we could pay millions of dollars to everyone. But some of these conductors, and I mean, I, I, I might be in the same boat, but they come in for eight to ten weeks. And, of course, they do way more than just conduct. They have a lot more obligations. But they... It is a full-time job. It's considered a full-time job, but they come in for eight to ten weeks, oh, and they get paid six hundred thousand dollars. This is another. This is another uh, topic because you're talking about how the world has evolved, and I don't like it either. Just from my standpoint, you know, um, it, when I was a kid, Eugene Normandy was the conductor of the Philadelphia yeah. Orchestra. His name was synonymous with the orchestra, and he was there the majority of the time. In fact, he uh, Ormandy rarely, to my knowledge, accepted. Other engagements, occasionally he might be a tanguid in yeah. the summer, once or twice. Yeah. Um, but in the summertime, when he had holiday, he and his wife, uh, Greta, they went up to the Berkshires and they just rested. Yeah. And he, he devoted those 44 years to Philadelphia. Yeah. Yeah. And I went. I was one of the beneficiaries of that almost every week when I was a kid in my late junior high school, senior high school you know, people, friends would not be able to go to the concerts at the last minute and I would, I would be the beneficiary. Yeah. Of this. So, yeah. I mean, I was... Many and I also played with them as a young a young man several times. But but um, the, the the devotion to any one spot. In fact, if you de let's just take I don't want to say name names, but a conductor in any one orchestra, if they devote too much time to the orchestra, people today would say, oh, he or she is not in demand elsewhere. Yeah. You know, so you, you almost can't win. It's like, it's, yeah. like, it's, it's a catch-22 situation. It's a terrible situation, but I, I do think it needs to change because some of these conductors take two or three full-time positions with major orchestras. I don't agree with that. And, and there's no time. I, I don't think, I mean, I... It's also taking work away from people such as yourself who would love to have a position. Of course, but not only that, even assistant conductors, you know, they, they made these positions for uh, assistant conductors to come in and conduct holiday concerts or pops concerts. But I, I know so many people that have gone on to the various symphonies, and again, I won't name names, but have come back to me and said, oh, you know what, major conductor, the main conductor of the orchestra wasn't conducting the children's concert I took my kids to, so... We didn't experience that great conductor. You're, you know, so I just wish they were more involved. Bernstein was much more because he did the young people's concerts. I love those. I love those. Oh, absolutely! I, I grew up on those. Yeah. I mean, uh, yeah. I mean, when I played with Philly as a kid, I played with with uh, their assistant conductor, Bill Smith. But then again, this is also different. William Smith was the assistant conductor for years in Philadelphia. He was the he. He, he was, he, like today, when you have an assistant conductor, they stay for one or two, maybe three years, and yeah. that's it. And then yeah. you have another set of yeah. conductors. Yeah. Yeah. I guess because there are too many, they need to accommodate. But Bill Smith was it. There was Ormandy, and then there was Bill Smith. Mm -hmm. And that was it. Um, and you had a sense, again, of continuity. These were people who were leaders in the, in the, of the profession. And building the community. And building the community, and and building the community. Yeah. absolutely. Yeah. It's, um, I mean, I don't even know who the, I hate to say it, but I don't even know who the assistant conductors are of the symphony right now. I should, but, I mean, I know Ludo, but, yeah. um, and he's leaving, but, you know, it's a different world, yeah. uh, Tigra. Yeah. It just is. Thank you again for joining me, and hopefully we'll do this again at some point. Oh, good. Thank you for having me.